All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a video which I did last year, but I'm not happy with the audio on last year's video. We're gonna be looking at general exam advice. The reason why this video is so important this year, even more so than last year, is you've spent most of your two years of VCE in remote learning and just not doing traditional assessments, not sitting exams. So the actual end of your exam, that two hours, is a pretty foreign concept to you that you might not have thought about too much. And so I'm going to be providing a whole bunch of like tips and advice for the lead up to the exam, the exam day, and sitting the actual exam itself. If you've already watched the video from last year, a lot of this advice is the same. I've also added some more things in to kind of make it more relevant to this year and just extra things I think are important now as well. So without any further ado, let's get into what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be talking about pre-exam preparation. So you are deep in this part already. You will be preparing for the exam. Hopefully you're doing practice exams, you're doing all different things. We're talking about techniques for preparing for the exam um, and different strategies you can use in the lead up. What's your on the actual exam day? This is something that we don't often talk about, but the um, VC economics exam this year is on the 11th of the 11th at 3 p.m. Which is a weird time for an exam because when have you ever done an assessment at 3 p.m. in your life? We'll get to talking about that later on. And then we're gonna talk about sitting the exam itself. So when you sit the exam, how should you use that 15 minutes of reading time? You probably haven't thought too much about that. How you should approach the multiple choice questions? How to plan out your answers in shorthand to make sure that you are including everything that should be in that mark allocation. Why you should be highlighting key terms and as well as the importance of hand strength and endurance now that you haven't been writing by hand for most of your VCE. So we're gonna get straight into the pre-exam preparation. So first and foremost, at this point in time, practice and past exams are your most, your best tool, your best friend right now, really. But there are some things that you should focus on with them. So even though it's a practice, I know a lot of people when they do practice exams, just jump in head first. You should use reading time. You're not used to reading time. Just practice what you're gonna do in that. You are modeling what you're gonna be doing in the end of your exam. You should use that reading time for setting strategies of what you're gonna do in the exam. We're gonna talk about reading time specifically for the exam later on uh, and what you should do in that reading time, but you should be using it when you do practice exams. You should also go in blind and answer everything that you can from memory. No matter where you are at, this is a really good thing to do. Because what's going to happen here, by going in mind, going blind and doing everything from memory, you are going to find out what you are good at. You're going to find your strengths and you're also going to highlight your weaknesses. Which is good because what tends to happen is at this point, students don't want to do practice exams yet because they're worried that they're not going to do well. And so what students do is they go away and they revise the things that they're really good at because they want to feel good about themselves. They pat themselves on the back for that. And then they do practice exams too late. And there's this whole range of things that they're completely blank on and can't do. Once you've answered everything you can from memory, go back and fill in all the gaps with a different color of pen. So go in with the red pen, fill in from your notes, add anything that you've missed out on and try and fill it out the best that you can because you're going to remember those things as well. And they're going to stand out because they're in a different color. And then what you should do after that is go back and check the examiner's report and try and give yourself a mark for some of the questions. The examiner's report um, is going to make a lot of suggestions of what should be in the answers. It's going to give you some examples of really high-end answers. You can have less than some of those high-end answers and still get the full marks. But one other thing I really recommend is if there are some great phrases in the sample answers, you should steal them. So steal any great phrases from sample answers and start using them in your answers. There are things that I like to use, like... Um, saying the derived demand for labor. I've started saying that because I saw it in a VCAR examiner report a few times. I was like, that sounds really smart. I'm gonna keep using that. And then after you've done all those things, you should get a teacher or a friend to look over it and give you some feedback. And written feedback means far more than marks. So that's gonna be really, really important. So the marks that you get on a practice exam are meaningless. The feedback that you get and what you do with that feedback is what's important. If you do nothing with that feedback, it's worthless. If you take that feedback, you reflect on it, and then you do something about it, then that is going to lead to growth and you are going to perform better in future. You need to find what your weaknesses are and turn them into strengths. Getting a friend to look over it is really important too. So like teacher, first point of call, get their feedback. They're an expert. Your teacher is really, really smart. Get their feedback, reflect on their feedback. But if you can get a friend to look over it, or you can look over a friend's practice exams and you are able to verbalize and vocalize what 
um, they should be doing, you are going to help yourself out immensely and you're also going to help that out them. If you can explain what is missing from a friend's answer in really, really clear English, it shows that you know your stuff. You are an expert now in that little bit of area and you will not forget that. If you can teach something to someone else, you will not forget it. You know it incredibly well. Also, one other important thing I always like to point out is assume the person marking your exam is an idiot. So there's going to be multiple idiots marking your exams. They're going to be very, very smart idiots because they do know economics. But why I say assume they're an idiot is because you need your answer to be really clear. You need your answer that if someone who didn't study economics reads your answer, it should make sense. So you should describe the key characteristics in the question. So if anyone else read that answer, based on the context of your answer, they should be able to work out what it is. You can't just jump straight into an answer because it doesn't really set the scene for what you are saying. So you've got to assume they're an idiot, really highlight all of your key points and describe the key terms. So there are also many other useful revision tools, but you should only do the ones that work for you. So that's the really important one. Do the ones that work for you. Don't just do, like a lot of schools really, really strongly suggest using certain revision tools. I do not think that. You should find the ones that work for you and do those. So like, for example, some people like Lotus diagrams. I hate them. I look at them, I think they're dumb. They don't work for me. They don't work for how my brain works. While others prefer doing things like mind maps, summary notes, or drawing pictures that represent concepts. I really, really like um, mind maps in economics because everything's so in interconnected that you could have things like aggregate demand and then have all different factors branching off it. And then how those factors branch off to each of the goals and all of those kind of things. Um, and it really flows nicely and shows how everything's interconnected. Um, and all of those areas. So it makes a lot more sense to me. So doing things like that really, really helps me. Also, weirdly, one thing that I've started to like a lot more in recent years is drawing pictures that represent concepts. And there is a lot of like um, backing to this in studies about memory, where if you draw a visual representation of something, you remember that and you can draw the information out of it. So that's something that benefits like, um, depending if you can draw something abstract that includes a whole lot of the content, that's fine. If you can't, that's fine too. A lot of us that study economics aren't the most creative people in the world. Um, summary notes are also great. I really like trying to summarize all of your notes down to shorthand to take up as little space as possible. So trying to get all the content into one A4 page, potentially double-sided. If you can have all your content on that, then that makes it really easy to flick over as well and have a look at everything just to check that you know what you're talking about. Um, and so that's really, really useful. I think I had an example once of a student, like I used to do this and I'd just put it up in my bedroom. I'd stick it on the wall and I'd look at it a couple times a day. I had a student once that laminated it and they'd take it into the shower with them and they'd read it while they're in the shower, which I find incredibly weird, but hey, whatever works for you. Um, I also really enjoy listening to music while studying. Um, and anecdotally can say that some university exams, I was able to think back to the music I was listening to while studying and it helped jog my memory, which is tied in with like state-based learning, semantic network theory um, in psychology. But um, the same, I used to like study for the length of an album that I liked. And then once the album ended, I'd have a break and then I'd listen to another album while studying. And sometimes I'd think of those songs and then it would remind me of um, what I was doing while I was listening to that music. And then it would jump, start my memory, I'd remember the content, I'd be able to write down an answer. That's surprisingly effective for me. Might not work for you, it might just distract you. Other thing is try and predict questions. So how VCAR makes questions is they take the key knowledge and then they mash it up with the, essentially the task words that are in the key skills. So you might look at, if you looked at area study one, you'd see that there's like the law of demand, law of supply. And then when you look at the key skills, it says construct diagrams. It's like, oh, I'm gonna have to write, um, I'm gonna have to make, um, some demand and supply diagrams. You'll look at um, unit four, error study one, and it'll say, evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of aggregate demand side policies at achieving domestic macroeconomic goals. So you're like, well, there's probably gonna be a question that says, evaluate um, budgetary policy at achieving full employment recently. It's like, well, I can predict that question based on mashing those two things together to get questions that are relevant to the current study design. Um, one other thing I'd say that's not in this currently that, um, is a useful thing to do. A lot of students look at the exams, so like say, you might look at the 2017, 2018, and 2019 exams and be like, well, they're out of date now. All you're gonna do is take those exams, whatever they're doing, make the question current. Um, so if it's asking about the labor force at that time, just talk about the labor force now. The data might be wrong 
in the question. It might be wrong in the examiner's report for how you're answering it, but the question itself is still good. Then, also, you should try and access as many different resources as possible. So I really rate the CPAP study guide for Unit 4. Um, I have it here. It's really, really good. It has all up-to-date data, policy, etc. It has a lot of really great um, exam-based stuff at the end. It's got ripping apart questions to see where the masks come from. It's got things that haven't been asked before. It's got major events that have happened in the economy. It's got a practice exam in the back. And it's like $35. It's really, really a good deal. Um, I wish I got kickbacks for saying that, but I do not. But um, Romeo Sala and Toby, Tony Robertson that write it are incredibly expert people. And you should probably, if you don't have that, you should look into getting it because it's really, really good. The ABA often holds free online presentations for students in the lead up to the exam aimed at VCA students. So you should look up that, see if that's happening. Um, the ABA monthly bulletins are incredible for up-to-date summaries of the economy that really talk about the important things in terms of our curriculum. So check that out. Um, there are many different revision lectures. Some are still happening. Some have recordings available for purchasing. If you've missed them, wink, wink, go to my website. Um, there's also the RBA snapshot and trading economics are the best resources for data. If you want the most up-to-date data, trading economics is always the most up-to-date, but the RBA has a really good snapshot of the economy that gives you just kind of like the key economic indicators, household indebtedness, and all those kind of things in a visual form, which is really good to print out, put up somewhere, so you can always see what that data is. The only real data that's gonna change between now and the exam is the unemployment rate. So that 9.6% economic growth, 3.8% inflation rate, that's gonna stay the same. So if you print that out, that's gonna be good to go up until the exam. So the exam day. When we talk about the exam day, the actual exam isn't until 3 p.m. So that is pretty late in the day. You haven't sat, like you're normally you're finishing school around that time. You're not used to doing assessments at that time. So making sure you do the right things during the day will make sure you're alert and able to perform your best in the exam. You don't want to feel lethargic in the exam because then if your mood's down, if you're feeling flat, you're going to struggle to access your memory. So some of the things I find that help is starting the day with some exercise, not for everyone. That can vary. For me, that would be going for a 10K run or doing some weights. For you, that might be going for a walk. That might be walking the dog. That might just be like playing with a sibling. That might be doing a workout or some yoga. Doing something active will help fire up your brain and get those neurons firing so you can think clearly. Eat a good breakfast and lunch to fuel your body. I talked about this in my class the other day where this will vary based on the person. For me, this is eating healthy for the day. That might not be the case for you. I have some students who can eat like a ridiculous amount of KFC and then thrive. If I did that, I would feel like I was going to die. So eating the food that is gonna make you feel good and sustain you through the exam. I also recommend maybe having some caffeine before the exam, but not too much. Caffeine's an amazing thing, but caffeine, it's kind of like this weird thing where it's a bell curve, where you have a little bit of caffeine, you start performing really well, and then if you have too much caffeine, you fall off a cliff and start doing terribly. Um, so more like a parabola, really. Um, and so you want to be at this point, because if you're at this point, you're going to be all jittery, and if you're at this point, you're going to be lethargic and tired. If you know where that point is, do that. It might help you be more alert and feel more confident in the exam. So try and avoid sugary foods that give you short-term energy but lead to a crash in the exam, like energy drinks. Although they, they fit the caffeine bill, they're really high in sugar, so therefore they might lead to a crash. You want some really like long, sustainable energy. So um, things that are going to fuel you all throughout it. So that's really important for the exam day. And then when you are sitting the actual exam. So in my opinion, when you get reading time at the start of the exam, that reading time, that 15 minutes, I think you should spend most of that 15 minutes answering the multiple choice questions. The reason why I say this is the economic exam is very, very long. I often find that students don't worry about the multiple choice in reading time. They go straight to the short answer and they start trying to plan answers to the short answer in their head as they are going through. And then what happens is that they run out of time in reading time. Then they go, they start trying to answer those questions and they've forgotten what they thought about because they've done too many things. Their short term memory can't hold that much and they lose it. Whereas with the multiple choice, if you think about the answers, the answers are still there when you go back to them. And then your recall is really, really quick. So then very, very quickly, you can get 15 marks worth of um, questions done and move on to the short answer. And any multiple choice you don't have done yet, you can then spend time doing things on. I also really recommend with the multiple choice, if you get like demand supply type questions, draw diagrams for the multiple choice because that will often help you get to the right answer. A lot of students just try and do it theoretically and picture it in their head, um, and it doesn't work because you confuse yourself. So draw the diagrams and that will give you the answer. So if it's supply and demand and there's a shift, 
you'll be able to then see, okay, it's gonna be a lower equilibrium point and less quantity overall. Cool, I've drawn that, I know that's the answer, I can just pick the right answer. It takes not a lot of time and it will help you out a lot. Once you've done that, I'd probably choose to start with the questions focused on area study one because they're the most theoretical in nature, but that's just me. You might feel more confident going with unit four, area study two, because it's most fresh in your mind. And then don't do the exam in order. Tackle the questions in whatever order your confidence levels tell you to. So whatever you feel good about answering, answer. It will help build your confidence and then help you answer the other questions. Leave the ones you don't know for last. Um, I think it may have been last year or the year before. There were nine really ans easy answers of theoretical um, trade-based questions at the end of an exam. I remember having students who didn't get to them because they were working in order and they were spending too much time on questions they weren't sure about and they knew the answer to those questions, they just didn't have time to get to them. I also say plan your answers in shorthand and highlight keywords. So highlight keywords, I mean directional words, so like favorable, unfavorable, uh, increase, decrease, least likely, all those kind of things that like give meaning to the question, tell you what you need to do, and then plan your answers out. So if it's an AD based question, so it's like if there's an increase in income, that leads to an increase in private consumption spending, leads to an increase in aggregate demand, and that should lead to an increase in strong sustainable economic growth. And then if I've done that, for a question, I can then just turn that into sentences and know that I've done everything to answer the question. Um, also, you haven't sat many real exams in your life, so make sure you take small breaks during the two hours to stretch out your hands and you, because your hand and wrist endurance might not be the best. Luckily, this is towards the end of the exam, so you'll build up a little bit more than you currently have, but make sure you take those little breaks so you don't exacerbate things too much. So like, stretch your hands out, do these things, do that, will help your wrists out a lot, and that will also help you like get your head in um, check so you know everything that you're doing. But that's pretty much it. If there are any other bits of advice you want, let me know. I'm always around by email or on my website um, to answer any questions that people have. There is also going to be a written version of this on my blog on the website, so www.therunningeconomy.com. If you want to email me about anything, sean at therunningeconomy.com. Other than that, thank you for watching a video about exam advice. Hopefully this is beneficial to you. Um, I've been doing a lot of other videos about predicting what might be on the exam. Feel free to check those out. I'm going to try and get out the rest of the um, fast um, recaps of all the different areas of study. I'm going to try and do unit one, area study one, uh, unit three, area study one, and unit th um, three, area study two in under 10 minutes, which is going to be a serious challenge. I'm going to have to talk very, very fast. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time. Bye.